Uh, I'd like to start with a brief devotion uh, based on Matthew chapter 18, uh, the first uh, six verses. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Obviously, from Jesus' words, children are pretty important to Jesus. You know, we uh, as adults maybe sometimes downplay that, and you know, maybe we uh, ignore our, our kids because they they pester us all the time. Or it's, mom, mom, why, why? You know, uh, but children are pretty important to Jesus. In fact, he uh, uh, holds them up as the example for us. You know, you never see that in the Bible where God says, "Okay, children, look to this adult as an example of faith." But you do see this, where Jesus says, okay, if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, become like a little child. Have that humble faith like a little child. So children are very important to Jesus, and they set a good example for us as far as, you know, when it comes to the faith and having that humble, simple, childlike faith. But along with that, then also goes that warning, Jesus says, if anybody causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it'd be better if over the side of the boat with the millstone, you know? Down, 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 blub, blub, blub. It's a pretty serious warning, isn't it? Um, and it under underlines this, that, the fact that, you know, because children have that simple, childlike faith and trust, it's easy for people to take advantage of them, mislead them, and lead them into sin. And so Jesus gives that warning, God forbid that you should do that, that you should lead a little child into sin. Um, and uh, uh, in that way damage their, their faith and trust. Serving children in ministry, whether it's you know, Sunday school, or vacation Bible school, or pioneers, or whatever, is a wonderful privilege. And, and when you have those, those children, you see that excitement in their eyes, and you're teaching them the stories about Jesus, wow, it's just, it's just an awesome privilege, a wonderful privilege. But it also, with that wonderful privilege, is that awesome responsibility that I want to be careful how I carry out that ministry uh, so that uh, I don't mislead the children and I certainly that I don't lead them into sin. And that kind of uh, ties into why we're uh, um, embarking on this path with a child protection policy as well. That you know, the, the last thing we would ever want is for a, a child coming to our church to be taught about Jesus to be, to be harmed in some way. So with that, let's begin with prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for uh, the wonderful privilege of being your children, children through faith in, in you as our Savior. And Lord, we thank you too for the children that you've brought into our families, that they're gracious gifts from you, and the children that are part of our church family. We ask your blessing as we do our best to teach them about you and to lead them to follow you as their good shepherd. Uh, grant us your wisdom and strength as we carry out the responsibility and help us always to do our best and never in any way uh, to bring harm or to mislead the little children who so easily trust us. Uh, help us uh, and grant us that, that wisdom and strength will always point them to you as they're a good shepherd. We ask this in your name. Amen. Okay, the main thing that we're going to be talking to, about tonight is the child protection policy that our congregation recently adopted and then how that kind of applies to different ministry settings, whether it's Sunday school or Pioneers or the uh, Children's uh, uh, Activity Center, you know, different things like that. Um, and probably the first question that comes to mind is why did we go down this path? Why did we adopt it in, in the first place? And it really kind of goes back to the fact that we have a growing problem in our society. And that growing problem is pornography. Uh, many would say that you know, pornography is an academic in our, in our society. I mean, it's so prevalent on the internet, it's so prevalent in, I mean, it's so easy for kids, adults, whatever, to, to have access to it. You know, it's not like it was years ago where, 
You know, if you wanted to, uh, some pornography uh, magazine or something like that is behind the counter, you know, someplace, and you had to, you know, you really had to go make an effort to find it. It's not that way anymore. It's everywhere. And because it is everywhere, a lot of people have gotten caught up in that particular sin. Um, and because they've gotten caught up in that sin, um, they look for ways to try to satisfy those sinful desires. And sadly, uh, oftentimes they try to satisfy those sinful desires by taking advantage of other people, especially those that are vulnerable. Now, those could be older adults. You hear about that sometimes, where people are taking advantage of and abusing older adults because they can. But sadly, then, it's also often children um, because they're vulnerable, they're trusting, people take advantage of them. So, um, you know, the last thing, as I said, the, the very last thing we would ever want here in church is for children to come here to church to learn about Jesus, their Savior, and then end up being molested or abused in some way. And sadly, you hear about it all too often. I mean, uh, just, you know, myself and my family, we were uh, visited some friends on our vacation at the beginning of July. They were from Green Bay, Wisconsin. And, you know, while we were there, um, they told us about a uh, church Thankfully, it wasn't their church, but a church just down the road from them where um, they had an incident and it was all over the newspapers and everything and it was a, really a, a sad, sordid story. And uh, like I said, you just hear about it you know, too often. So uh, our church has adopted uh, a policy uh, the, uh, this last July to um, protect children and uh, especially from child abuse. And uh, so we're going to uh, walk you through that uh, document. Lori's going to jump in here and then walk us through it and answer questions that you have, um, talk about different situations and settings, uh, how it applies. So, Lori, we'll turn it over to you. Okie doke. Well, thanks for taking time out to be here tonight, you guys. We understand it's summer, and so my goal is to get you out of here in less than an hour. So we'll see how we do. Um, hopefully y'all picked up a copy of the Child Protection Policy. We're just going to actually read through this and, in portions and segments and then talk about it and see if you have any questions. Um, so we start with our Biblical Foundation and Goals. Would somebody like to read that for us? Anybody can? Candace, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> our children and youth receive the Kingdom of God through faith. They are entitled to find church and school places where they find adults they can trust. Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church is committed to care for, support, and protect all children who enter its doors and share with them the love of God and Jesus Christ. The church is called to welcome and nurture the child. Our goal is to maintain a safe, secure, loving place where children may grow and where those who care for them may administer to their needs in responsible ways. The physical and sexual abuse among children and youth in our society necessitates a child protection policy. Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church has instituted policies and procedures to reduce the risk of child abuse in our church and church-related activities. Our policy is intended to protect our children. However, the policy also benefits parents, teachers, staff, and volunteers as well. We believe that this policy will help reduce the risk of child abuse occurring at Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church, as well as minimize staff and volunteers being placed in positions of risk. We uphold that to report abuse is to be a witness to the world of the love and justice of God and recognize that reporting abuse is a form of ministering to the needs of those crying out for help. To report abuse can help to stop existing abuse and prevent further abuse. We are committed to protect and advocate for, chil for children and youth. The church, at all levels of its organization, is entrusted with the responsibility of providing an emotionally safe, spiritually grounded, healthy environment for children and youth in which they are protected from abuse. Okay. Any questions thus far? Great. Okay, so the child protection policy. What you see in bold there is kind of the, the policy in a nutshell. It says, Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church requires background screenings for all staff and volunteers at or over the age of 18 who are overseeing, supervising, transporting, or have access to those under the age of 18 who are in our care. Um, somebody want to jump in and continue reading there? Lynn? 
No person may be entrusted with the care and supervision of minors or may directly oversee and or exert control or oversight over minors who has been convicted of the offenses outlined below, has been on a probated sentence for any offense outlined below, has received deferred adjudication for any offense outlined below, has presently pending any criminal charges for any offense outlined below, until a determination of guilt or innocence has been made, including any person who is presently on deferred adjudication. The following offenses disqualify a person from care, supervision, control, or oversight of minors. Any offense against minors as defined by state law, a misdemeanor or felony offense as defined by state law that is classified as se sexual assault, indecency with a minor or adult, assault of a minor or adult, injury to a minor or adult, abandoning or endangering a minor, sexual performance with a minor or adult, possession or promoting child pornography, enticing a minor, bigamy, incest, certain drug-related offenses, or family violence, a prior criminal history of an offense against minors. The following offenses disqualify a person from transporting anyone under the age of 19, having a suspended or revoked driver's license, inability to provide proof of valid insurance. Note. Youth participating in adult ministries are not deemed to be in the care of the ministry members, such as ushers, bowling, darts, etc. Okay, how about any questions on that part? None? You guys are an easy group tonight. <laughs> okay, so basically those, those offenses, those things that are up there on the top of that page are what's going to keep somebody from serving in one of our ministries with children under 18. Okay? The purpose? Somebody want to jump in on that? Adam. <laughs> These procedures are designated to reduce the risk of child abuse in order to provide a safe and secure environment for children, assist Trinity Lutheran Church in evaluating a person's susceptibility to supervise, oversee, and or exert control over the activities of children and youth satisfying the concerns of parents and staff members with a screening process for staff and volunteers, provide a system to respond to alleged victims of abuse in their families, as well as the alleged perpetrator, reduce the possibility of false accusations of abuse made against volunteers and staff. I'll jump in and do this quote along because it's the shortest one. So it says, uh, a state child protection program is mandated by statute. There are laws which declare a child's right to be free from abuse and neglect. Illinois has child abuse reporting laws with varying definitions of child abuse and varying provisions as to who may and who must report penalties for not reporting and required actions following the report. Any questions? Real quick. Yes, Adam. I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have my glasses. I noticed you were holding it a little far. <laughs> I figured that was the case. <laughs> sorry. I thought you were brave without my name. never would have gotten anywhere. Okay, we look at the standards coming up on the next page. This is where it gets a little confusing, and we'll try to clarify that for you as we go, okay? So, somebody want to take all of point one there. A brave person. I will. Oh, I will. Yes. Yay. <laughs> Back, go for it. One, criteria for screened authority figures, floaters, and assistants. Authority figures are the primary leaders of youth and children's activities. To work with children and youth, infants through high school, the authority figure must be a minimum of 18 years of age. Special situations that involve large groups, for example, BBS, compromands students typically at, their, at the end of their eighth year, grade year or older, may be considered authority figures. Minimum age. The following standards for authority figures, whether volunteers or staff, are de designed to separate authority figures from the group they are serving by age or enough years to reinforce recognition of the authority figure's role. A floater is an adult authority figure with visual and physical access to all areas. A floater could be a staff member or a screen volunteer who can move in and out of classrooms recreation areas, and meeting rooms, 
functioning as an additional set of eyes and hands. Assistants are persons who lend aid to the authority figure and act at the direction of the authority figure, including volunteers. Assistants must be, in general, a minimum of 12 years of age and four years older than the participants, and in the judgment of a staff member, competent to assist in the activity. Under special circumstances, junior high age students may assist at the discretion of the ministry leader. For example, VBS, Sunday school, Easter egg hunt, etc. An assistant under age 18 will not be counted as an adult in the child-adult ratios, except under special circumstances. See note under adult-child ratios. In special situations that involve large groups, for example, the Easter egg hunt, one-time assistants may not be screened. Parents are welcome to stay, observe, and help with activities. In order to qualify in the assistant role, they must be screened. Okay, so let's kind of break that down and talk a little bit about what that means. Lynn's back there shaking her head. Lynn helped write this policy, so don't, <laughs> don't let her fool you. Um, okay, so in terms of authority figures, so that would be um, all of the staff would be considered an authority figure. A ministry leader would be an authority person, basically the person in charge. Okay. Um, a floater, an example would be, for instance, we have people that would serve in the nursery, um, and we may just have one adult in there. But if Mr. Blower happens to be responsible for being the floater to check in and make sure everything's going okay, he could be viewed as the floater. It could also be another ministry leader, another adult over the age 18 that could be the floater. So what we're trying to avoid is one adult alone with children. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Um, the assistant is anybody else that's helping in those roles, um, and they can be a minimum of 12 years, but we're trying to keep that four-year difference. We're trying to meet everybody where they're at, so we're working with it. Any questions specifically on this or anything that I could clarify for anybody? Oh, well, Mr. Blower goes in there as a floater. Yeah. Does he need a chaperone with him? Does somebody have to... Make no, sure. No, there's someone already in there. There's somebody already in there. Yeah. Okay. I'm just, it seems like a, maybe I'm thinking outside the book here, but I'm just. Yeah. So we're trying to have two people. So yeah. we're not we're not ever going to assume that a male needs an extra chaperone. That's what I'm yeah. getting at. Yeah. That's kind of what I thought you were getting at, Adam. I know you well enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Um, and actually, you would find that statistically, there's a number of women that are actually accused of those things, too. But Mr. Blower has been screened, as all of those floater people will be screened. Does that make sense? No, no, that's fine. I just... Yeah. <laughs> yep. Our goal is ultimately to keep the kids safe. Any other questions on this <coughs> part? Okay. The six-month rule, number two. Somebody want to grab that one for me? Beth, my friend. <laughs> number two, the six-month rule. Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church imposes a six-month rule in the selection of new members wishing to give service in the areas of children and youth ministries. Volunteers seeking to serve in the leadership or authority role of children and youth ministries must be members in good standing of Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church for a minimum of six months. The six-month rule will be waived for clergy or staff if they accept a call to or are hired by Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church or Illinois Lutheran Schools. Persons not meeting this minimum requirement may only serve in an assistant role. Okay, Beth, you're a perfect example of this, right? So let's talk a little bit about that. So the six-month rule does not say that we don't want new members to serve. We absolutely love that you're here, that you're going to serve. The six-month rule says we're not going to put a new member in that sole leadership position over a group of children, okay? Is that clear? Okay, awesome. Any other questions on that? We'll move on. Another volunteer place. So now this is the um, responsibilities of volunteers and staff. The two adult rule. Somebody want to jump in? Thanks, Debbie. <laughs> the two adult rule. Whenever possible, all children and youth programs should be staffed with a minimum of two adults. When impossible to staff with two adults, there must be an additional adult serving as a, as a floater with visual and physical access to all areas. A floater could be a staff member or a screen volunteer who can move in and out of classrooms. Recreation areas and meeting rooms functioning as an additional set of eyes and hands. Note, in the case of the Children's Activity Center, 
an exception will be made to the two adult rule as follows. It is the responsibility of the ministry leader to schedule and supervise the volunteers. These may be teens. And for the Children's Activity Center, who are the Children's Activity Center, who are to care for the children and assure that at least one responsible adult is a designated is designated as a floater. Okay. So that's the, the two adult rules. So for an example here, um, this past summer during the Beth Moore study, we had a number of youth workers in the Children's Activity Center. And I was that designated floater. So I made up for that two adult rule as I could move in and out to make sure that things were being handled properly. The kids also knew that I was the go-to person if there was an issue. Who give us this floor? <laughs> <laughs> we have none of those. I should be happy to report. Um, any other questions? Okay, down to adult child ratios. <laughs> Go for it, Debbie. We love adult it. child ratios. No, all ratios must be understood in the light of the two adult rule standard. For example, having two adults present at all times for children and youth ministry activities. Example, recommendations from the state, there must be one adult to ten children at four years of age. You must have two adults at all times or one adult with a floater. For example, the first ten children, you must have two adults. Church programs are encouraged to the following minimum adult ratio, child ratios. Infants, six weeks to 14 months, one adult to four infants. Toddlers, 15 to 23 months, one adult to five toddlers. Two years of age, one adult to eight children. Three years of age, one adult to 10 children. Four years of age, one adult to 10 children. Five years of age, one adult to 10 children. Grade one through four, one adult to 10 children. Grades 5 through 8, one adult to 15 children. And grades 9 through 12, one adult to 15 children. Mixed age groups following the youngest child ratio. In special situations that involve large groups, for example, VBS, confirmands, may be considered adults. Okay. Aren't those like the DCFS standards, too? I think they're the state standards. I think they're the state ones, because I think at the early learning center, we had to have so many for yeah. kids. I mean, it's not like you picked random numbers. We did not pick yeah. random numbers, thank you. <laughs> we followed, followed numerous sets of guidelines that were laid out for us, so that was good. Okay, uh, any questions on that, or we'll move on to transportation. Can you just make sure that that's clear? Because I know that was always the part that was confusing when we were going through it. Like, transportation? Like, no, no, sorry. Oh. The, the ratios. So, the ratios. So, just like give an example. So, if we're at Pioneers and we have, you know, 20, kids in grades, you know, one through eight. Right. We need to have at least three. So grades one through eight, and you have 20 kids. So there's there's that one. Um, that's in grade one is the youngest, right? Right. Right. So that would say one to 10. Yeah. Um, I guess one adult depends. for 10. So right. If we had, so if you have children, children, you're going to need one more adult, correct? Right. Well, and it still goes, Pastor, go ahead and jump in. Yeah. They use a floater? Right, but you could get by with two if one is a floater. Okay. Two you, total. You could one get by with two one total. Being the floater. Right, okay. because you know, one one would be the floater. I mean, ideally, with that many kids, you probably want two adults in the room all the time, because especially if especially if it's twenty boys. That's <laughs> 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 all. The girls are kind of crazy. <laughs> so we hear Lynn's looking for extra volunteers for boy pioneers, so up that number four, okay? <laughs> we'll make that number higher, yeah. And then what about with the Children's Activity Center? So if they have, so I know you were saying that the one person in there, the second person would probably be the floater, but what if they get to a certain point? I know if they have too many young kids, do they say that, sorry, you can't have any more kids in there? Yeah, because it's hard to stack that. You don't always know who you're going to have. Exactly. Some days we have zero, and some days we have five or six. So we typically try to plan for adequate numbers. If if we need to pull somebody in there, it's always advisable to grab somebody who you know is screen and bring them in and have them help. With. Yes. So that would be like you have you're in there, you're overwhelmed, all of a sudden you have a, you know an additional kid come in. You need to go out and find the floater so they bring. From well, home. I don't think you know. Um, what what's our average in there, Michelle? Um, from 9.30 service, there's usually I, not, that, not as many. Okay. 
with the Bible classes and stuff, the one day I think I had 15 in there. Oh. But yeah. that, that's a high. That was only once yeah. or twice. Like, we need to build, you guys. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. 15 kids in there? Well, it depends. Yeah. And sometimes well, it's an overlap. Like, and there right, are one service is normal. People are going to class or something. So then you might have just had one or two kids. Right. And then all of a sudden you have six or seven kids. And then. Mm -hmm. there, were, there were a lot of us in Bible class that had kids. Mm -hmm. Okay. And most, of them, most of them were from the Bible class. Lately. Okay. The hard part Thanks, about Michelle. That is if you have you. a baby, you can kind of carry a baby. You know, right. I mean, if there's yeah. a baby, you can't. Exactly. It's different than just having kids exactly. that are like, reading. Exactly. So it really depends on that age difference. There, it does. Yeah. You know, and um, I think we're working on that. Yes, Michelle? We want to make sure that we have eventually. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right, well, I have a whole list of people. I just got to, I just yeah. procrastinate. Yeah, can we like go after, can we like maybe try to recruit your people who were volunteers? You absolutely can recruit the Because they people. would just be volunteers, they wouldn't even have to be screened, right? Cause they're Correct, still if they're school. under 18. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we can recruit some of them to help out. I have that whole list for you. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> we're working on it. Hey, Lori, whose yes, responsibility sir. is this to monitor this region? So, the responsibility of this and again, keep in mind that floater concept would be the ministry leaders. So if you guys feel like you're getting in over your head and there's like too many people here, you need to say this to one of the staff members, hey, we got to get some extra help in here because our program is growing by leaps and bounds and this is a wonderful thing, but we need additional help. Make sense? Yeah. And so you can always use your personal member ministry coordinator to say, do you have some names for us of people we might be able to recruit, you know? or invite into ministry, okay? Cool. Other questions? Thanks for that one. In Sunday school, you might have a toddler class with 15 kids, 15, 17 little kids. Okay. But I, it would just be me, but I would have you helping. Okay, and, okay. and those are assistants, absolutely, okay. absolutely. And you still have a floater, you should have another adult that's moving throughout the building. Pop their head and say, Melissa, are you okay, dear? <laughs> and she's got all these little people climbing all over. But that's awesome. That's awesome. Okay. Anything else? Awesome. So now we go on to transportation number three. A volunteer, please. Traveling to and from COVID <laughs> events. It is recommended that all drivers be between 25 and 65 years of age when transporting children under the age of 18. From time to time, drivers outside these age ranges may be utilized at the discretion of the authority figure and in compliance with the Illinois state law. All drivers should be screened in the same manner as the volunteers for the event. When private vehicles are used to transport children and youth for programmed church-related events, leaders should ensure that appropriate insurance is being maintained by both the church and the private driver. It is recommended that two adults be placed in each vehicle whenever possible and or the vehicle's team in minimum groups of two that stay together at all times. On all planned transports, a signed permission slip must be on file. In the absence of such a form, the church staff shall call the parent or relative to sign the form, give verbal consent, or pick up the child. All drivers and passengers must comply with the state regulations. Transporting children and youth to and from home. It is often the adult, or it is often out of the pastor's children or youth leader's control as the manner as to the manner of the procedures by which children or youth arrive for and depart local church events. It is, however, likely that these persons may occasionally be asked to drive a child or youth. We offer the following guidelines. Ministry leaders and church staff will make every effort not to, tra to not transport a youth or a child unless a second adult is in the vehicle with them. Okay, so there's a couple of things that we want to touch on there. First, um, we don't believe that we do a lot of transporting at this point. But basically, this policy follows the same idea that we use in our school system, that you would provide a copy of your driver's license and a valid insurance card to the ministry leader, or better yet, to the staff member, um, and they would have that on file um, in the office prior to the trip. Okay? Make sense? Um, and then in regard to that transporting children and youth to and from home, you know, we know everybody's friends, you know, Lynn may have her sister-in-law say, hey, could you bring one of the kids or something like that. What you choose to do um, on your own 
is is okay. It's it's where those situations where you're putting the church at risk. So we really want to make sure that that's clear. Okay. Other questions? Okay. We are moving right along, you guys. If the kids were to walk somewhere, yes. We just need a permission slip. Uh, permission slip. Uh, yeah. Okay, so screening procedures, we're going to get down to now what this process is actually going to look like. And Debbie, I'm sorry, you can't read anymore. We're overusing your voice, my darling, but thank you. If anybody else want to read? <laughs> and if they all say no? Then she's got to come back. No, no, <laughs> Anybody? I'll read. According okay. to the dictionary, to prevent is to stop something effectually by force, force, by force stone. Stone. action action and rendering it impossible. It is the hope that within the activities of Trinity, Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church, we might prevent the abuse of children, youth, and vulnerable persons in our care. The initial and most fundamental step to prevention is the careful screening of the persons who will have access to children less than 18 years of age. Although we recognize the integrity of an overwhelming number of persons with a disconcerned calling to ministry, to ministry with children and youth, we realize that abuse still occurs in the church. Therefore, we believe that all persons should be properly screened and all screening documents kept on file. The following steps will be followed in screening volunteer staff and potential staff applicants. One, completed online application and consent form. Two, background screening performed. Social security number verification to determine all present, past, Sorry, I lose breath. <laughs> to determine <laughs> all present and past places of residence. Uh, B. Sterling National Criminal Database. Sorry. Yes. Okay. C. The na Nationwide Sex Offender Database. D. Additional county courthouse screenings will be run at the discretion of the background screening administrator. Three. Background screening administrator monitors the results. A. If the screening comes back fine, move to point four. B. If there are questionable results flagged by the background screening provider, it will be called to the administrative pastor's attention. Four. Volunteer is scheduled to meet with the ministry leader or volunteer orientation and training. Okay. Thank you, Melissa. Mm -hmm. I hope we haven't moved things along at all. <laughs> get if we have, and if you're writing it, that's good. That's good. Um, couple of things there. So just so you guys understand, the background screening administrator, that's myself, um, Pastor Dennis is the administrative pastor. If there are any anything that would be flagged, the only person that would see that would be Pastor Benz. I have no access to that. We also don't have any access to your social security number, your driver's license number, any of that stuff. And we'll touch on that a little bit more as we, we go forward. Okay. So procedures for questionable results. Somebody want to jump in? Candace, thank you, dear. Procedure for questionable results. One, when we are notified by the screening provider that a person who applied for a background screening has questionable results, the background screening administrator will notify the administrative pastor. Two, the administrative pastor will open the report and review the results. The administrative pastor is the only one who will have access to such reports. If necessary, he will seek clarification from the screening provider and or additional searches will be run. Three, person will be contacted by administrative pastor and meeting will be scheduled. Four, administrative pastor will discuss results with the individual. One, what type of offense? Two, how recent was the conviction? Three, how severe? And four, how often? Five, the administrative pastor will document the conversation. Six, the administrative pastor will apply the child protection policy. The pastor will discern the questionable results. Seven, if the pastor deems the individual fit to serve, the pastor will notify the background screening administrator of the recommendation and any restrictions. The person will be required to have an additional background check run in one year. The pastor and screening administrator will employ strictest confidential standards. In the unlikely event a board member or ministry leader becomes involved with a questionable result, they will be held to the same confidentiality standards. And then the frequency of the rescreening, it's recommended that the staff and the active volunteers for children and youth programs be rescreened every three years. You guys like the way I take those really uh -huh. short ones? Yeah. So any questions that you have on the procedure for questionable results? 
I take it these people that are screening are good people. They're certified companies. Oh, the company? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We have one billion people compromised. <coughs> Absolutely. But Absolutely. Patrick, is, you get the final say. So if it comes back, someone's a sexual pedophile, you didn't get to decide how severe it is and whether or not they get to help out or not, correct? Correct. Okay. Right. That's what I thought. Yeah. So let's say, for instance, that what was on the record was that they raped somebody at age 18 mm -hmm. and it happened to be their spouse. And they get this information comes and it, there was a charge filed and everything. They ended up getting married. Pastor gets that on his okay. plate. You know, do you understand? I, I mean, there, there could be some things that yeah. were ultimately like, Oh man. Yeah. You know I understand that. I just didn't know if he was ultimately the one that was like, Well, I understand you only you know, took a few little kitty pornography pictures and that's okay. <laughs> I'll forgive you and now you can come help. Well I got this for you. <laughs> <laughs> Just implementing the background screening procedure, most of the people that get to this point will not have any issues or anything on their record. Mm -hmm. But it, it's preventative. You know what I mean? They'll go, oh, you're going to screen, and oh, I can't be alone with kids for six months, and oh, you guys may be too much trouble. I'm going to go to that church over there. Yeah. And try I, over there. That's fine. Keep on keeping. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, okay. Um, any other questions on that? We're on to the back page. We're doing quite well, you guys. Um, reporting abuse and abuse or, or alleged abuse. Beth, thank you. I have a short one. Okay. Seeing abuse and hearing the truth of abuse is the most difficult of us. Abuse is a highly emotional issue that has at its core the violation of trust in the common understandings of healthy, whole, loving relationships. People most, most often want to believe the best of others and therefore they have difficulty believing that an acquaintance or friend is capable of abuse. With emotions stirred by this volatile issue, our, our vision is often clouded and the voice is unheard. All reports of child abuse must be taken seriously and handed, handled in ways that care for the well-being of both the abused and the accused. All cases of suspected abuse must be reported directly to the pastors or staff minister. They will then take the appropriate action in notifying the local law enforcement. Procedure for responding to a suspected incident of child abuse. One, in the case of an allegation of child youth sexual abuse, the volunteer is to remove the accused from the situation and immediately notify the closest available pastor or staff minister who will take control of the situation. Two, the pastor or staff minister will suspend the accused from duties involving children while the matter is being investigated by authorities. Three, the pastor or staff minister will make a written documentation of everything done and said. If the person reporting the allegation is a volunteer, both the volunteer and the staff member to whom the volunteer reported will document the procedures taken. Four, the following steps will be taken by the contacted pastor or staff minister. If possible, immediately notify the administrative pastor, immediately notify state authorities, failure to report any suspected, alleged, or witnessed abuse is a crime, immediately notify the parents, guardians of the alleged victim and respond to their questions and concerns, make a written documentation of persons contacted and actions taken to this point. The administrative pastor will notify the chairman of the congregation, notify the insurance carrier of the incident immediately and comply with its investigation, if any, prepare a written statement and designate exposed person to respond to media inquiries, respond to the needs of the alleged victim and his her family, respond to the needs of the accused and his her family, inform the affected volunteers and paid staff members of the need of confidentiality, Consider and respond to the concerns of other parents. Make written documentation of persons contacted and actions taken. Okay. Do you guys understand what your role is in the case of if, if you suspect something? I just have a question. So um, it's kind of as long as mandated reporter type stuff. Right. So if 
if a child comes to you and says, my uncle, who's not affiliated with church at all, is that just kind of the same procedure? You talk to the pastors and talk about that. Okay. Yeah, and they will give you some wise words of counsel. Do, now, do are we, will we be deciding like a mandated reporter? No. Okay. Okay. Any questions on this part of the policy and what the procedures involve? Um, the next thing I'd like to do is walk you through the online background screening process. Um, if you take a look at that agenda that you have in front of you, there's a lot of words on here, and we're just going to touch on things pretty quickly. Um, the first thing is what uh, what the screening checks and does not check. Okay, so if you had a parking ticket, it's not going to show up. Okay, if you happen to bounce a check, it's not going to show up. If you bounce lots and lots of checks and you were charged and it was a federal crime, you will probably get fired. Oh, you um, have to do a lot of them for that to happen. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Our baby friend back. Yeah, in with that. Okay. Um, it does. It it isn't checking into your credit or anything like that. Okay. The actual things that it's going to run are on page six there in point two. The social security number verification, the Sterling National Criminal Database, and the National Sex Offender Database. And then that additional one, if something was flagged, then we could also run an additional check if we needed to at the discretion of past events. Yeah, I do have a question on this. Do yes, you guys yes. use actual paid sites or do you use generic sites that are free? No, we do not use free. It, the, the company is called Protect My Ministry. And it is utilized by a number of our wealth congregations and is um, federally secured or whatever and regulated in terms of the information and how they handle that information. Okay, because uh, I had an issue with a staffing agency that just ran Deborah Ritchie. Yeah. And then they didn't hire me. They said, oh, there's something with your name. And I'm like, no. And I had to, I talked to a lawyer to get that straightened out. So, yes. But that's when you go to these generic sites. So I just wanted to use a legitimate site. Yes. Well, and the one of the reasons we chose Protect My Ministry is if there are 42 Deborah Ritchies out there, they're going to make sure that they get the right Deborah Ritchie, and they do the legwork on that. So that's one of the benefits of working with this company. Oh, that's okay. Um, who will have access to your information? Again, only Pastor Benz has access to that. What I get to see is the lovely little C that comes by, okay, that says that your, your report is clean. Um, so that's that's great news. Um, and we're going to talk about the clear and flag thing in a minute. So I'm going to talk you through the application process here a little bit. Um, and we're going to back up, see if it'll let me back up, to trinitycreek.org. <clears throat> Be patient, Lori. Right? Too far. I went too far, of course. We'll go back. So here we are. This is the front page of the Trinity website. If you haven't been there, you should go check it out. We have an amazing guy that does that. Um, if you check out the Get Involved section, this one little one down on the bottom where it says Get Involved with uh, the picture of Sean Bruns, there's a little white box to the left of it, and you just click on that, and it's going to take you to the Get Involved page. Round right about the middle of the page there, you're going to see the words, if you would like to serve with children or youth, Please click or read our child protection policy. Um, then click to complete our online background screening. So we're going to click on that. And that's going to take us right to our Protect My Ministry site. Okay? And you can see that it's customized for Trinity, so you know that you're on the right page. The first thing you're going to notice is it says that um, please enter your information within the next 40 minutes. This actually should take you about five if you sit down with all of your pieces of information with you, okay? So we'll just walk through this. So you're going to put in your full legal name, um, check this box or enter other names that you may have been known by, so maiden names, okay? Current address, if you know the date, month, and year. Hang on one second, Lynn. If you know the date, month, and year. If you don't know the exact date, month, and year, you can wing it. They're not going to come after you because you didn't know the day that you moved into your college dorm apartment, okay? <laughs> so just kind of give, give a rough estimate on that. Lynn, what can I do for you, my dear? Um, what if you have a suffix at the end of your name? Do you just 
Who does that? I'm just asking in the event anybody in this room that may Anybody in this room has a suffix. Hmm. Billy, we may learn with you. How's that? So you put it in, and, and well, I would put it in the well, last. I did it. Yes? And I also don't remember what I did. <laughs> there wasn't a place for it, so I didn't put it in, but it goes by your social security number. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, so you didn't yeah. enter yourself. So I, I don't think so, because there wasn't a spot. Okay. okay. There you have it. <laughs> oh, come on, Billy. <laughs> okay. Um, so they're going to ask for three previous addresses. If you have the zip, great. If you don't, we've, we've seen people not get kicked out because of that. Um, then as we scroll down, you see you need your social security number, so you're going to want to have that handy. Um, you're also going to put in your date of birth. Um, and then fill in the rest of the spots there, phone number, email, confirmation of the email, and driver's license. Um, we did find that we had a couple of issues. If you get to state and for some reason you can't get um, it to scroll right or not, just keep hitting I and eventually Illinois will go on the box. If you have a real issue, call me. Um, a couple of our ladies, bless their hearts, they were working on it together on the same computer and one said, Lori, I put that I'm from Nor North Dakota. Does that work? <laughs> I'm like, oh, I guess I get to learn some more. So we figured out how we could fix that for them. So after you fill all this out, you're going to hit that next button, and it's going to take you to a page that is here somewhere. Okay, I set it down. Did I set a piece of paper down? Here, I did set a piece of paper down. Okay, um, and it is the disclosure and authorization page. And so I just want you to know what it says because it sounds scary. You know how they give you those legal terms and it always sounds important. It says, in connection with my application for employment or to serve as a volunteer with Trinity Lutheran Church, I understand that a consumer report or investigative consumer report as defined by the Fair Credit Reporting Act will be requested by Trinity Lutheran Church for employment volunteer. So that Fair Credit Report um, that they talk about, that is exactly what we talked about, the Social Security verification, but it sounds like a bunch of things, credit card report or something, you know, that's not what it is. So, just so you know that, and then um, I can't click on the next button because it's going to tell me I left something vacant, you know, and bounce me back, but that's all that's on that next screen. So, literally, if you have your stuff with you, it should take you five minutes, okay? A um, couple other things. Um, if you do leave it open for 40 minutes, it's going to bounce you, and you'll have to start all over. So that's just for your protection. Okay. Okay. So after your application has been received, so I will get it. It'll say clear, and it comes back pretty quick. So if you happen to be a ministry leader and you're nervous about, <gasps> I want this person to serve, and you know, like tomorrow I want them to serve, or the next day. I would appreciate it if you could give me at least three days to make sure that the recordings run, but um, it is fast in coming back, so you should know that. So there shouldn't be any major issues. If it's flagged, a couple reasons that you can be flagged. You typed your social security number wrong. You typed your driver's license number wrong. Um, there's some sort of record error, perhaps, you know, they, they are struggling with which Debbie Ritchie are you, and we need to confirm something else. You might get a phone call from Pastor Vince, so don't panic. If I see a flag, I'm not going to panic, okay? So it doesn't tell me anything, so you should know that. Um, so it's a big flag with a different last name on your social security card and your married name? <laughs> I've only been married eight years. I guess I should probably go change it. <laughs> well, eight years. you don't have to make true confessions here, Deb. <laughs> but, you know, if, if something comes up, and you can explain that to past friends. It's not a big deal. I'll right? I'll change it. I'll change it. Okay. It's time to real pain. You know, sometimes we like, we like to be held accountable eventually. You know, whatever. Yeah. Um, it's only been almost eight years. Oh, man. So ministry leaders and staff will receive a list of cleared volunteers on or around July 1st, September 1st, and January 2nd. So you'll know who's been screened. So if you know Lynn, for instance, 
that my good friend Tracy over here is going to come, and for some reason her name's not on that list, would you give us a yoo-hoo, wait a minute, because Tracy thought she filled out, she thought she was all done, Lori never saw it, and all of a sudden we're like, ooh, we better figure out what happened with Tracy. She forgot to hit the submit button, and then, you know, whatever. <laughs> Just kidding, Tracy, I mean, be picking on you, no, no, no. Um, so that, that's an example of a couple of things that you should know. Um, once you have given permission to us to run that screening, we're going to run them every three years. So as long as you continue to serve in children's ministry, we will run those background screenings. But you won't ever have to do another thing. Okay? So thank you for being here tonight. This is a good thing. So a couple of steps going forward. PMM realized that this now became a qualification for our youth ministries, and we have all those lovely ministry position descriptions. So we are going to take care of updating those all for you. And those responsibilities um, are listed on the back of what we will be adding to the ministry position descriptions. Um, for the volunteer that they've completed and passed the online background screening process. Um, and then responsibilities are to read and follow the child protection policy. Okay? Ministry leaders, yours is a little bit more. Um, same qualification, responsibilities, same read and follow the policy. Confirm that all volunteers over 18 overseeing, transporting, or having access to youth under age of 18 have been screened and are cleared to serve. So we need your help. Because you know what? I don't go to boy for years. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we, we have to work together on that, and I think that that'll work. And then in the event of field trips, verify that all drivers have been screened and provide a current copy of the driver's license and insurance card to the appropriate staff member prior to the trip. Okay, so we're not trying to add anything to anybody's plate. We're trying to make this as minimalistic as possible, um, but hopefully that helps. So, any... Yes, Tracy. And babies, because I knew, but what does PMN stand for? PMN stands for Personal Member Ministry. How's that for a mouthful? Oh, that's why it's PMN. So that's, <laughs> that's my job. That's what I get to do. I'm very excited to do it. Um, member Ministry, it just means, you know, the role that you have in carrying out God's work here on earth. So Member Ministry is that's what it's all about. Anything else that I can help anybody with at this point in time? There was discussion at the Pioneer meeting about bathroom and sleepovers so glad you guys brought that up so that takes us to 4b and i almost missed it shame on me um safety guidelines for your ministry so this is um i'm sorry back 4b on the uh, agenda side not the policy oh, side oh. so this policy really just addresses the screening procedure what we would like you guys to think about as ministry teams is what are the best practices? What should we be doing in those areas? We're not trying to complicate your lives or anything, but we should have a consistent plan and process and procedures, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we're going to ask that you guys do is think about safety guidelines for your ministry over the course of the next year and try to get those on paper by May 1st. And then we'll come together and discuss with the board family and the ministry leaders what we think those best practices are. And then we'll take that next step come next spring. Does that make sense? We also talked about Girl Pioneers meets here in this room. And it's easy to monitor the back door, but not the front door, as far as somebody coming in. Mm -hmm. And does that door lock? Can we lock it from the outside and still be able to exit? Because like if we advised our parents to come pick up at the back door. Yes. Okay. The answer is yes. Because in the past we hadn't really thought through all of that, but it makes sense about some of that stuff. Think so. through that. That's mm -hmm. good stuff to think through. Because ultimately, what do we want to do? We want to keep our kids safe, right? Well, <laughs> well like you said, I mean, a lot of kids are only going to. I mean, they go to the bathroom by themselves, but technically, somebody else could be in the building and. And right. No. Yeah, I knew that. Right. I knew it, no. right. And so, so that way would help us restrict some of that access. I agree. The girls also want to camp, but right away, the beginning of September, September. So how does that play out now? The beginning of September. That's earlier than we thought. <laughs> <laughs> we thought we were going in the spring. <laughs> um, Unless it changed since. Uh, did yeah. it change, Mark? Oh. Yeah. 
What's that? Did it change since our meeting the other night? I think we were waiting to see what's up in the air if we could camp, and then we were kind of holding out to see if we could camp. But maybe Jack here or Elizabeth already talked to you about that. They haven't talked to you. Okay. They yeah, will. we're shooting to camp in September, but then with all this coming up, they'll we're talk to you. going in the spring. Yeah, <laughs> so maybe we'll be going in the spring. <laughs> or not going at all. They'll figure it out. That's up to the Chiefs. <laughs> <laughs> They'll figure it out. It'll be good. Okay. So thank you for bringing those things to our attention. That's good. Anything else that I can help anybody with? So if you go home and you fill this out, if you have any problems, my cell phone is on the bottom of this page. You can call me anytime. Um, I am just there for you. So you just call me and say, I'm having trouble with this. And um, I'll be more than happy to help you with anything that you may have. I don't think most of you, most of you are younger than me. You are not going to have an issue. You're going to fill out that for me, Bob. There's no big deal with this. Billy, you are younger than me. I know you are. And you have a competent wife. So even if, <laughs> even, even if your computer is your nemesis, you will, you will be okay. I'll go home one day and be like, all right, we got to fill that out. <laughs> so here's the good news. We finished in less than an hour, as I promised. Pastor Vince, would you like to close for us? Let's bow our heads. Oh well, Lord, as you have uh, graced us with another day, we thank you for the blessings that you've given us today. We thank you for the privilege that we've had to, to live our lives for you and, and ask for your forgiveness for any of our failures. We ask you for your blessing this evening as uh, grant us quiet and restful sleep, and we may uh, serve you again tomorrow, always to your glory. Amen.